Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, the information philosopher, webcasting from my ITV studio here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm hoping to reach philosophers and scientists around the world to help solve some problems in philosophy, in physics, in biology, and in psychology. I also hope to reach any of you wondering about the deepest nature of reality and our place in the universe. We live in the information age, but I've found that very few philosophers or scientists are, understand the nature of information, which is a very abstract uh, concept as compared to matter and energy. Information is neither matter nor energy, although it needs matter to be embodied in our brain, for example, and it needs energy to be communicated like this lecture coming to you over the internet. But matter and energy are conserved quantities in the universe. It may be hard to believe, but there's only the same total amount of matter and energy in the world, in the universe as a whole today, as there was at the very beginning, nearly 14 billion years ago. And if the stuff of the entire material world is just a fixed total amount, what can possibly explain the evolutionary change that we see around us? I'm going to try to show that the changes are in the information and the order. Uh, since the beginning of time, this information has been increasing, unlike matter, which is a constant. And this increase in information and order is despite the second law in thermodynamics, which uh, tells us that the increasing entropy destroys order. Okay, I'm going to cut this uh, standard opening uh, short today because I'd like to show you where these um, arguments are on my website and hope some of you will go to my website and take a look at the uh, explanations of those uh, things there. But I'll start by mentioning that today's talk, uh, since it's Friday, uh, is going to be on Albert Einstein. And it carries a theme uh, that we've been working on for some time with uh, Richard Feynman on Wednesday and his explanation that there's only one mystery involved in the two-slit experiment. Uh, it follows on our discussions of wave-particle duality. And we're going to, again, come back to Einstein, who discovered this strange non-locality way back in 1905-1909 time frame. And uh, it led him 30 years later to f discovering the concept of entanglement or non-separability uh, of two particles. So Einstein has given us a great deal of um, insight into uh, puzzles. Uh, mysteries is what Richard Feynman called them. So uh, before I start that, though, I thought I would uh, take a look at, let's see, uh, this homepage of Information Philosopher uh, and try to talk to you a little bit more about each of these thoughts that I've been putting into my opening section. Uh, I'm also debating whether to have a standard, you know, two-minute opening. I've been putting a music bed behind it. Some people said this would enhance people's uh, appreciation of what I'm doing. I'm not so certain. Uh, I'd love to get feedback uh, from uh, my few uh, viewers out there. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about how many viewers we now have and how I can build more of them and how I can try to, try to provide lectures which are dealing with the topics you want to be interested in uh, from among the many that I I cover on my Information Philosopher website. Um, so let me uh, get my mouse over here, find out where it is. Very strange, there it is. I'm running several screens here. Um, so I want to show you that um, the website gives you a few drop-down menus. Uh, free will is the subject that we deal with on Tuesdays. Um, the uh, quantum mechanics will be more or less uh, on Fridays when we're dealing with uh, Albert Einstein and, and my fourth book, which is um, on Einstein. Here, here is that book, it's a very draft version of it. 
And once again, I always remind you that although I am producing print books with my work in it, uh, I don't want there to be an expense uh, for professors who are recommending my books in classes. So I've taken all the individual chapters in the book and put it on um, my website uh, under, let's see if I can find that. Not exactly. Let's try this one. No, there it goes. Here's the book, for example, on, on Einstein. Uh, my God, he plays dice. How Albert Einstein invented most of quantum mechanics. And instead of buying the book, although it would be great if you thought you needed a print copy, you can go through the book and find chapters, uh, individual chapters here. And should you be interested in one chapter, his light quantum hypothesis, a subject we treated on the very first uh, lecture three weeks ago, you simply click on the uh, page icon and you get a copy of the page which can be enlarged, I think, like that and so forth. And uh, you can print it out, of course. Uh, you see my chapter numbers and uh, my illustrations. And I believe, um, I hope you will want to get into this subject uh, or any one of the subjects that I hope to treat because I have a wide ranging interest from philosophy to science, especially physics, but also biology and psychology. Uh, all of them thought about and analyzed using this notion of mind that information and information structures especially information structures that are somehow managing their own affairs. They are uh, using information processing to control the flow of matter and energy uh, through them. Uh, it's obvious that uh, all living things need matter and energy to survive, but we know so much more about this than we did 100 years ago uh, or so when uh, Erwin Schrodinger famously was taught by his father that it isn't matter that we eat that actually is what keeps us alive, but it's the energy that comes in with the matter. And without energy and matter, we couldn't uh, survive. Well, young Erwin went off to college and he uh, learned about thermodynamics, became a great expert in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and then quantum mechanics eventually. But before he got to his quantum theory, he went home again and he told his dad he'd learned about a thermodynamic quantity called entropy. Now, entropy is one of those really, sadly so, mysterious words. People hear it and they, they have a vague sense of it. If they've learned much about it, they know it has to do with disorder, it, a loss of order, a loss of information. And so I... Uh, find people say, how can I be emphasizing information in the world when uh, the natural processes of thermodynamics destroys order? And uh, I'm very happy to say, uh, we talked about this on my lecture on Feynman, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, David Laser on a Wednesday. When we, on Wednesdays we do uh, individual scientists that I've studied. Let me go back from this page and see if we can get back to information philosopher and see that over here um, I've, I've studied uh, a couple hundred different uh, philosophers who have some of them and given us uh, a great deal of understanding. Others are difficult, uh, but they are worth understanding. That's why I've, I've made a, a page, a web page, sometimes very long page uh, on, on anyone I feel uh, deserves attention. So um, coming back here, then the web, uh, the homepage has, among other things here, a list of all the problems, specific problems. We spoke about the problem of consciousness uh, on our opening, opening lecture. Today's our 20th, so 19 lectures ago. Entanglement is something we'll get to again, especially as it involves um, Albert Einstein. The problem of evil comes from this point of view that if the universe contains something good in it, something ordered and informed information like life, life is often perceived as a fundamental good, we need to protect it. Uh, it but that gives rise to the problem of evil. How is it, what is the force of evil in the world? Uh, prominent two-sided view of good and evil uh, is a very uh, interesting question. 
Identity is a problem that's perhaps uh, relegated to metaphysics these days and logic, but um, uh, something we'll deal with. The immortality of a, of a soul, I will argue, is related to the immortality uh, of our own internal um, self. Uh, the problem of the self is a very um, debated problem. Many people say that there is no such thing as our self. It's an illusion. Uh, those are the same illusionists who say free will is an illusion. Uh, the mind is an illusion. There's nothing there. It, consciousness is an illusion and something that our mechanical, uh, biological, material body is fooling us and giving us this uh, feeling that we are a self with a mind and uh, free will and consciousness and so forth. Uh, but I will argue uh, in very simple terms that um, the, um, the uh, what are we looking for, the immortality uh, is, is a, a concept that go, goes way back to the Greeks who used to argue that their heroes uh, like Achilles, uh, had, became, became gods, not just heroes. They became gods because they uh, f had uh, found a, a, an immortal uh, memory in the minds of the Greeks. That, and they called it kleos, which is basically glory, a, a great reputation. And as long as that reputation is held in the minds of Greeks, then they have this immortality. Um, I find that the Japanese uh, religion uh, that encourages people to remember their ancestors uh, has a, an echo of this idea of the kleos that comes down to us through the writings of Homer, which have given us the information about Achilles. Um, and uh, those in Japan who every year very studiously and religiously go and, and try hard to remember their ancestors are keeping information about the ancestors alive. So if we back off to the somewhat unusual uh, notion I'm trying to develop with ourselves, that we are in fact not our material, not the um, uh, physical in the sense of material, but something that's physical in the sense of information, but it's not material, it's immaterial, it's thoughts, it's our experiences, it's our knowledge. And this aspect of ourselves um, is something that uh, makes our own selves. We are our information. I'll argue this, say, two ways. First of all, we're not our material. At the moment, I am my material, no doubt about it. I see all the cells I have in here and uh, all the way down to the atoms and molecules that make up those cells uh, are constituting uh, myself. Uh, that question of identity we were on just a moment ago, it seems related here because am I the same person, metaphysicists ask, am I the same person I was when I lectured to you yesterday? Surely there's been a change in me. In particular, I've eaten something different for breakfast and uh, lost some material uh, in the meantime. If I am not the same material I was yesterday, uh, am I the same person? And uh, my attempts to deal with this deep kind of um, sometimes considered a psychological problem, sometimes a metaphysical problem about what constitutes myself if Yesterday, I was I had different material in me, and uh, the nutritionists and the those who understand our biology realize that much of what we are as a living thing is being is dying inside. There's a vast amount of death going on in this living thing. Billions of our cells are dying every second. Uh, the specific example I'd like to try to teach some of you to appreciate this uh, phenomenal thing that we are is that our red blood cells, which carry all of the important uh, energy, because we are not just the material, but the energy to move that material around and get the cells to do their functions for us, that matter and energy um, is, is, is dying. Uh, the cells are dying. And the particular red blood cells die at the rate of 200 million red blood cells every second. And 
inside one red blood cell, there are 300 million hemoglobins. Each of those hemoglobins involves 30, 300 amino acids. So we're talking about 300 times 200 million times 300 million. This is 60 quadrillion uh, things that need replacing every second. Uh, it therefore seems clear to me that we are not primarily the uh, material things going on, but we are instead the information of which the highest uh, and most important is that which is in our minds, because there we've recorded all our experiences, and that really is the, 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 who, the who we are, the self we are, is that part that remembers. When you've lost all that memory, should that memory suddenly be gone, it's some serious question uh, whether you as yourself uh, still exist at that time. But then come back, why am I talking about immortality? Because um, there's the immortality that comes from your information being preserved by being remembered and uh, somewhat immodestly, I'm hoping that I will be remembered through my works. Uh, you may remember Woody Allen and uh, forgotten the film name, but argued that he did not seek immortality through his works, although he obviously is well known for his works and he will have an immortal aspect as long as we have theater and we have film and so forth. He also said, I'm not looking for immortality through my children and my offspring. He said, I'm looking for immortality through not dying, <laughs> which of course, uh, as we make uh, moves into the future and understand more and more and more about why it is some part of us is, is uh, going through a kind of uh, programmed cell death and eventually maybe the whole system decides it's been around long enough to reproduce if it's going to have children, offspring, it should have done it by now and that they, we then become uh, materially uh, not uh, survivable beyond some 100, 120 years, which is the normal lifespan of human beings. Okay, so I'm going down through my problems. I love to talk about all of them, and I'm looking to uh, feedback from uh, you viewers, should there be a, a reasonable number, and I'm hoping to set up ways in which you can give me that feedback but I want to say here, this, these are the subjects that we will try to deal with on Mondays every week. Uh, and in terms of that, uh, those feedback opportunities, uh, I want to point out uh, that I have here in the home page in the top, um, a little follow links, including uh, my YouTube pages, my Facebook pages, my uh, Twitter account, and my WordPress blog. Uh, where there's an opportunity for you to uh, comment on, on what I'm doing. Now, uh, here it all says something similar and reminds you, my new visitors to the website, to watch these lectures either live online or, of course, uh, by, by getting them on demand from YouTube. And it's not clear how many people will want to watch them online, uh, but I'm happy to say that in Cambridge, at least here in our, my town and Harvard uh, University, I'm able to be seen on local cable uh, channel, our public access CCTV station in Cambridge. Um, I want you to note that if I go to another page, these links will survive at the top, although pages in general uh, do not have this one right here. Let's go to my page on the mind. You see I still have my links up at the top. They look like they're not so well aligned. I guess that's a problem for me. Click over here to problems, see if this works any better. Ah, there's something wrong with the, the new links. Um, you're looking at the person who is basically trying to do everything for this uh, operation. Uh, I've designed and built the, tele the studio from which I'm working, and uh, I've put in place some technology that's just come into existence from a company called Teradec, who provide a little box called the Cube, and it comes in an encoder and decoder pair, and I'm able to send my lecture material through an HDMI connection that it might take it to a screen. Uh, it goes into the encoder box, the encoder cube from Teradec, travels over the internet to uh, the studios of CCTV, which is a few miles away in Central Square, uh, and there they turn it around and put it out on the cable. 
Um, that's relatively a brand new ability for me to do that in, in near real time. Of course, most of you are watching me through YouTube or uh, Facebook. And in that case, this very same cube is able to send a signal up into the cloud to what Teradek call their core services, where I can then have them multiply or split the signal and send one to YouTube and another one to Facebook. I could send one to Twitter, but it's not obvious that people are looking to Twitter for lectures. Indeed, I've you can help me think about this, I hope. Uh, look to advice to people who will be listening to me more uh, where you would like to listen to such things. And I'm told that YouTube is, of course, the great place where uh, these lectures will be stored and then available on demand for you to look at any time and look at them in the order of the playlists that I've set up. One for uh, the problems drop down, uh, which is here. One for um, my quantum work, or basically work with Einstein, if you like, my free will work will be on Tuesdays and so forth. And all these philosophers will be every Wednesday, and we'll choose different ones. Um, while I'm on this um, aside uh, about uh, the operation of how I'm, I'm doing all these things, I thought I might take a moment and uh, reply in a way to uh, one of the one of you who have uh, responded on YouTube or commented, now let me take this to full screen. And to do that, I need to press here. And you'll see uh, this is my YouTube website, and I've selected my lecture a couple days ago, separating free will from moral responsibility. And let's see if that's showing up pretty well. Yes, it is. What I want to do is not play it. I could do that. Um, I want to mention to you that my lectures now are all being closed captioned. And so uh, I find it very helpful to turn on CC and have a, a, along the bottom of the screen. Uh, let's do that for just a moment. See if that changes anything. There I am. Uh, my goodness, the fonts are very small right now. Uh, so maybe we wish they were a little bit bigger. Let's just hit it for Online a moment. Streaming video and Facebook similarly yeah. streaming video. Okay, so that seems to work. Um, but anyway, the interesting thing here today is that uh, one of my uh, one of the commentators out there named, or at least with a handle, uh, let's see, is Plank Sip. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly has uh, told us something. And let's uh, just see if I can expand what he's, what he's saying. He says, and maybe I can highlight, this is a nice advantage on this screen. Following Bob's vector of thought, morality and ethics are a function of culture, a reflection of society interpreted by the individual. And he says, interesting, thank you. But he says, I'm conflicted with contemporary concepts of responsibility and freedom, especially implications of personal responsibility and existence as presented through existentialism. Well, that's a very interesting concept, a question, uh, something that I have looked into and um, looked uh, to have presented some significant things, I hope, on it. Um, and to see where they are, let's go back to our, our web pages here. Uh, the home page would be do. Uh, if you go down the left-hand side, you'll see uh, among the 300, uh, one that I'll point out to you that I spent a good deal of time with in the ends will be Friedrich Nietzsche, who in many respects is the great father of existentialism. And let me give you a little bit of context, the answer to your your concern about what existentialism has to say about freedom and responsibility. And um, basically, I say here, Nietzsche attacks both free and unfree ideas. He's often quoted as saying we have no freedom whatsoever, that it's a great um, logical nonsense. Um, not sure where I'd find that quote. There's a very long quote. Uh, but I find that when he attacks free will, Nietzsche is attacking the, uh, let's expand this again a little bit, 
that uh, he attacks the free will of the theologians, of the religions of his day, that he feels was designed by the people who are using religion to get power over others. You remember the argument, uh, uh, the will to power, is that uh, Nietzsche's idea that some uh, individuals become, seek power for the purpose of controlling others. And he, as we read him carefully, I think critically find, he's in uh, hoping that we would uh, some of us be creators of new things and uh, produce value in the world uh, with his transvaluation of values though it has to be something that comes from our independence and our freedom and our creativity and so um, much of his writing includes the idea that we are free and we are creative but also the concept of free will the argument that we free will um, as Planck Sip has asked us uh, somehow also relates to our being morally responsible. And when that was set up by a religion in order to say that people are go ought to be guilty in the eyes of God, uh, then he really is, uh, and uh, other arguments when we're uh, lock lacking in the free will and responsibility story that's given to us, uh, then he, he doesn't like that idea. And this is from Twilight of the Idols. And um, the, uh, so there, this is something hard for me to just talk to you about right now, but I just want to say uh, we can, uh, uh, we, I've, I've, I've read a good deal of Nietzsche and John Paul Sartre, and the fundamental idea of existentialism is that man has fallen into the world uh, and existence, our existence came before any understanding of what it is that is our essence. And philosophers and uh, moralists, moral philosophers, want to think about our essence in order to find out what is, uh, what is the good thing for humans to do, uh, which brings us around to this question of the relationship between freedom and uh, resp moral responsibility that Planksip is asking about us. Now, just a couple days ago, we had Dan Dennett uh, and he was telling us something, uh, which, and I'd like to replay his little clip for us. He, he was saying that uh, we do not have the kind of free will that libertarians like myself uh, think needs, requires a break in the causal chain, a break in the um, uh, presumed deterministic uh, forces that argue that every event, including our decisions, has a prior cause, that there's a sequence of cause and event, cause and event, cause and event, and that everything is caused from some earlier events. Um, and Dan says, we don't need that. It looks to him like it's uh, thinking of miracles and interrupting natural laws, like the laws of nature. And instead, he famously said that uh, uh, that he thinks is not available to us, but there's another way, and that is to just argue that free will is moral uh, competence, he calls it. Uh, so let's listen to him for a minute, and I'd like, uh, I hope if Plank Sip is with us today, he'll listen carefully with this, and when we come out the other end, we'll try to explain what's wrong, something we haven't gone quite as deeply as we might, and what's wrong with Dan Dennett's argument. So let's see if I can open this page, turn his closed caption on, and turn him off. Of Preserving Make him the loud second. enough. As I said many years ago, the f kind of free will worth wanting, the kind that secures meaningful life and moral responsibility is completely compatible with determinism. That's one way you can go. Then the libertarians try to have both, and they end up embracing magic. The new breed of scientists that I'm mainly addressing here claim that free will is an illusion because determinism or close enough is, is the truth. But they go on to say that this has implications for responsibility. Roughly, that nobody is ever morally responsible. That's the 
conclusion that people are rushing to draw, and then they're bu busy telling us what adjustments to our laws and to our mores, to our customs we're going to have to do now that science has shown. Thanks to neuroscience, we've shown that people don't really have free will, and they can't really be responsible. Then they make a sort of half-hearted stab at saving some sort of hopeful line on morality. That is, having declared and gotten a lot of eyeballs in their direction, free will is an illusion. Wow. Then they say, and let us tell you how society is going to get along without free will and what we're going to do about so-called responsibility and morality and so forth. Well, that's one way you can go. What about working in the other direction? What about starting with the claim that free will is moral competence and then asking what this implies or presupposes about whether neuroscience has anything surprising to say about moral competence? So let me stop Dan right there uh, with his claim that free will is moral competence. Um, I hope in the lecture we did on separating free will from moral responsibility or being a moral agent uh, was, was understandable to you uh, because of the argument that the question of whether we are uh, determined by physical laws, determined by the laws of nature, by causal chains and so forth, that's a scientific question. Um, is there just one single future possible? Now, Dan is happy. As an actualist, he thinks whatever actually happens is all that ever could have happened. So he's very comfortable with actualism. But I'm not, because I know that down at the quantum level, um, at the formation level of molecules and macromolecules like DNA, and uh, uh, there's a good deal of randomness, which is quantum randomness. There's a good deal of indeterminism, of uncertainty, and all of that which is not that present in our everyday lives. And so we tend to average over large numbers of events and come out with an adequately deterministic kind of behavior for the most part. So given that Dan is happy with this, let's crit critically look at his idea of just saying, let's just redefine free will as moral responsibility or moral competence. Someone who's morally competent is showing us a kind of freedom or free will. Now, this is actually, according to Bob Kane, whom I've studied very closely, and I think we may take up Bob Kane next week as a, uh, our, our Wednesday philosopher of choice. Uh, Bob Kane says that the traditional definition of free will is that it is moral responsibility. Now, that's strange to me to go all the way over to it, it is moral responsibility. But that is, you, you see what Dan is saying. Free will is moral competence. Now, let's try to digest that for just a moment and think seriously. Uh, could this be the case? Does it make any sense? It seems if we look at the face of that, free will is moral responsibility. A morally competent person is the one that has freedom. That statement seems to imply, correct me if I'm wrong, that a morally incompetent person, a morally deficient person, let's to say an immoral person, has no freedom, according to this equation, that free will is that moral competence. Lacking that, do they lack freedom? Uh, this is an idea that goes back a long way in time, actually. Immanuel Kant, you can take a look at you know, my webpage on Kant and read his arguments and reasoning that says that freedom is somehow connected with this idea of moral uh, actions. Uh, Bob Kane, who we will try to look at next Wednesday, I hope, um, makes it very clear that what he calls the self-forming actions, which make us what we are, form our character. He's following an idea of Aristotle that in, during our lives we do certain things, take certain actions, make certain decisions, which are very big and important ones. He likes to identify them as torn decisions or moments of great kind of um, um, issues which, which have moral Im implications and so forth that those are the things that he wants to focus on as the freedom. So that's because, Bob Kane says, the traditional definition of free will is its connection to, or as Dan Dennett is telling us right now, it is the moral responsibility. Well, then we're in a situation where we have to say, you mean that 
a person who is doing something immoral is not freely doing that? Now, again, all the way back to Aristotle, we find the gate, his great phrase that virtue is knowledge. And if you look at that very closely, he seems to saying the virtuous person is doing virtuous things by reason of having knowledge, correct knowledge. Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, someone, a morally competent person, for example, does have knowledge of right and wrong. We can say that. So maybe that's part of the knowledge that Aristotle is referring to. And then he's saying that the uh, virtue, good behavior, is just knowing things. And maybe we can take that down to uh, the concern that uh, moral responsibility is somehow um, an issue for reasoning. Now, that was perhaps widely held throughout uh, thousands of years, uh, although I think in uh, in scholastic times, the question uh, was raised some more. Aquinas deeply looks into free will and uh, its connection with whether we know right and wrong and so forth. But let's home in on this. If a person who is morally deficient is immoral by our cultural standards, and coming back to Planksip's comment, um, I am trying to argue that our moral standards are set by us as a society, as a culture. They are something we create. And uh, it shows up because the standards of moral behavior are different in different societies today around the world, some dramatically di important differences. And they have been different over time. It's clear that moral uh, standards have evolved along with the rest of our uh, behaviors. Uh, so it's not at all clear that that uh, is anything but a human, a cultural, uh, invented uh, set of ideas. Now, compare that to the question of whether or not everything we do is, is um, determined by our, by our physical, our material selves, uh, by, our, uh, by our cells, but that the biology is somehow driving our way we behave through our genetic inheritance and through our environmental conditioning, through our education, through what our uh, society has done, forming our character. We form our character, and Bob Kane wants to say we can take responsibility, following Aristotle, for that character. But uh, all in all, it's a picture uh, that looks like determinism until you add an element of free will. So when we take Dan Dennett again and say free will is just identical to, it is that moral agent, it is that moral competence, it is more being morally responsible, we come to the conclusion that I cannot accept that when someone does something that's not in accord with our moral standards and our societal standards, that they are not free. That an evil person uh, who decides to do something is said to be unfree under the control of what? Some super intelligent evil entity? Uh, that's a convenient thing for people to say, oh, it was, you know, he was caused or she was caused to do something evil. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with that because I believe free will is a scientific question and moral uh, decisions are based on cultural uh, standards. Okay, well, I find I'm uh, enjoying this attempt to respond to uh, those of you out there. Let me put this way, window away, come back to this screen, perhaps. And uh, that's good. And uh, bring up our uh, lecture topic today, uh, which uh, deserves some attention. And what, we've, what we're going to try to show is that uh, already in his early work of 1905 and 1909, that Einstein, let's see, I need to bring this fellow up here. Einstein had already seen uh, a part of this issue of what is going on in the mystery we, we dealt with uh, a couple of days ago with Richard Feynman. Where can we understand, what can we understand about the path of a particle? 
as it goes through the two-slit experiment. And I'll just bring that up over here for a moment. Make this a little larger. We're back to Feynman. I want to just scroll down to the case of our two slits, put it up on our board, and I guess it would be best if I, let's just start with this one for a moment, give that full screen for a moment, and I cannot move my mouse around on that screen, so I'll bring it back to myself being here and just remind you what we're trying to say. When there is a single opening in the one-slit version of the two-slit experiment, there is a, a, a pattern on the back of the screen which shows you most of the light lands in this area, and there are little fringes, so there are a couple of other areas on the side. That's not so important. What's important is that when we go over to a two-slit experiment, we then have two places that the particle can enter the experiment on the left slit and on the right slit. And now, as the waves go out, we talked about this a good deal, the waves interfere with one another, and crests of this wave land up being in sync with crests from the right-hand wave, and that gives us a situation where there's a positive interference, constructive interference, and a good deal of light falling here, other places where there are null points and no light, and then again another uh, maximum or uh, another area where the light is falling. And the question becomes, what if we take this set of waves here along the bottom, parallel waves coming in and hitting the slits and then interfering with one another, what if instead of uh, a very bright wave doing this, we turn the light down and down and down until we're only allowing one light quantum particle at a time to be going through the experiment. Well, as you remember, I hope, and you've certainly read about it with a, a number of YouTube videos that teach this, and I'd like to be studying more of them as we go forward in the future and see if we can get them to help us explain what I'm about to explain. When the light is so low in intensity, it only consists of one single light particle at a time. Or, we also know this can be done with particles of matter, electrons, in which we have an electron gun, a beam, and it can be sending one single electron at a time going through the two-slit experiment. Now the question arises, if the particle is an indivisible lump, it cannot be split into two, then as it comes up and approaches the experiment, it must go through one slit or through the other slit. And if it goes through the other slit, why isn't it exactly the same? Why not exactly the same as we get when we have uh, just one slit available? Okay? All right. Hang on. Put on your seatbelts, as we might say. I'm going to try to argue that the interfering waves essentially have little to do with the existence of a particle. Uh, it does depend on the particle because the wave nature of the particle associates a wavelength with that particle. And the wavelength uh, associates a frequency also. These are the properties of light, they're properties of matter. So beyond that, however, the question of where in the inside the experiment there are places of, of large numbers of particles being found and others where there are few or none, that question is determined by solving what's called the Schrodinger equation for the wave function. And that sounds very technical, but what it is is telling us, as Einstein saw, and I'll go to see the time when he first saw that, Einstein saw that the wave nature just gives us the probabilities of finding particles. It is not the particle itself. Let's uh, keep this on the screen on one hand and go over to Einstein, and let's see if I can find him here. And here's his page, and we'll zoom down a bit until we come to his work in 1905, 
And there's his light quantum hypothesis, which we've discussed a lot. And this is the argument that light consists of one photon at a time. Here's his work on the so-called photoelectric effect. But here's his discussion of wave-particle duality. And wave-particle duality is often thought to be a consequence of the uh, first quantum mechanics was the study of particles and the second, uh, called matrix mechanics, with a lot of focus on particles uh, bumping into one another and so forth and finding their energy levels. And then the second form of quantum mechanics is known as wave mechanics because that's the work of Erwin Schrodinger, who wrote a wave equation, and that's the one you use to solve the uh, where particles are going to be found. Um, but here's Einstein, almost 20 full years before the founders of quantum mechanics, and he's talking about wave-particle duality. See if I've got Einstein up on this page, because if so, that would be something I can then uh, put my mouse on top of his ideas. And let's see, yes, here we are. Wave-particle duality. So let me switch to this screen for a moment and scroll down a little bit more until we get the picture that I've drawn based on what he writes. He didn't really write this picture. But he does say, and I can move my mouse on top of this, something I cannot do with my little Surface Pro, but I'm working on it. He imagined, uh, and this was a thought experiment, in which he imagined an electron fired at this metal plate which is much like an electron hitting the screen in an old CRT television tube. Uh, and the result of this collision is that uh, a photon, a quantum of light, goes out in a spherical wave in all directions. Okay. Now, Einstein said, uh, how can it be that this wave is carrying the energy that was in the electron and distributing it throughout this space on the other side of the plate. How can that be, he says, if the particle is then found, in some cases, by hitting a second plate, and this light energy particle is converted into an ejected electron from his photoelectric effect. Uh, And the energy of that electron appears to have almost all the energy of the original electron. Why, says Einstein, has the energy not dissipated and and traveled throughout all space in such a way that there wasn't enough energy to have this second electron, right? When a single X-ray in the particle picture hits another metal plate, oh, I see, I can't uh, highlight that for you. In particular, this is not essential to our understanding, though, Einstein said, well, what if the energy that was way down in this area Uh, how did it collect itself back so as to get in with the uh, creation of the new electron particle? And he worried that is so instantaneous and fast if this experiment is done in a very, very large room that it might violate his principle of relativity. Okay. So now on this, I would like to also have my two-slit experiment window open for a moment. Let's see if I have this here somewhere. Here we go. Come back to this one. We were here a moment ago. Let's look at this one. And come back to this, a similar picture. It's not the same, but um, we, we see, imagine that this one of these slits is where the particle comes through, and it's like the plate that fired the photon in, in Einstein's 1909 thinking. And Einstein is once again saying, how can this Uh, these waves be everywhere inside the experiment and then wind up landing at just one spot on the wall. I think I have here an an animation of that process. Uh, Not this one, but because it's called the collapse of the wave function. We'll be discussing a lot about this. Uh, Here's an animation, and it may repeat itself in just a moment. Let me take it to full screen. We have the two slits at the bottom, as we had before. And come on, let's restart. Maybe I should click to re- There it is, restarting. There's our two-slit experiment. 
we imagine waves going through both screens, and then bang, the, the picture here is that probability is now located where that red dot is. Uh, the probability is all there. How could it be? Look at those waves I've shown, a few waves over on the left side, left over from the expanded picture of uh, light going in all directions. Einstein says, what's going on? He we came to call it non-locality. That little probability just disappeared, and it's now incorporated in the red dot. And I, uh, it plays again. Let me go back to our other view then. This one, no, this one, yes. So what Einstein is now telling us, so I guess if I go here, I'll bring that to our screen. He's telling us that it looks as if quantum mechanics is telling us that the wave is just a statement about the probability of where the particle might land. Anywhere where the waves are have a non-zero value, that will be where we find the possibility of particles with a probability associated with the actual shapes of the waves. And when they interfere, there'll be places we find particles and places we don't find particles. OK, so that's 1909. And here we have, as late as the 1960s, with uh, Richard Feynman on Wednesday, and as late as today in our best textbooks, uh, the, the question, how can, what's the connection between the probabilities and the actual uh, particles? Let's come back to this one again. Uh, and let me go over here, get this window up for us. And I'll come to this picture again and try to give us this explanation. Uh, I'm going to say that the waves and their interactions with one another are solutions to that equation that gives us the probabilities of finding particles. Okay. The solution to those equations, you're looking at them. Visually, these points where there are constructive interference and others where there's destructive interference are solutions to an equation which is solved in the context of the, uh, the physical space it's in. Let me say that again. We solve an equation and what we do is we put in the so-called boundary conditions. We put in the situation around where we're looking for those probabilities. And that situation in this case has two slits open. In this case, it has just one slit open. So our solution to the quantum mechanical wave equation tells us this, this is the probability, this is the distribution of pl places we'll find particles on the back screen. This one says, given the two slits open, the solution of the Schrodinger equation about probabilities predicts that there will be f particles here and here and here, but very few elsewhere independent of whether there is a particle in the experiment at this moment. Okay, and this is a leap beyond I, what I think others uh, that I've read so far uh, try to tell us in thinking about this. They want us to think, how can a particle going in one side interfere with itself? And the answer is, as I hope to convince you and work going forward, it'll be a large part of my Einstein book, for example, I want to try to convince you that the probabilities of being anywhere depend on that wave equation solution knowing about the fact that the other slit is open at this moment. If we close that slit, we change the probabilities. And so given that these probabilities depend on both slits open, it really does not matter which slit the electron goes through because an electron entering this space finds these probabilities uh, and they, the probabilities are causally related to where the particle is going to be found. Now that remains a mystery and it is still what uh, Richard Feynman correctly identified as the uh, one mystery in quantum mechanics. How can pure information and as the information philosopher, I, I'm very impressed with this and also puzzled. 
it's not as if that information is pushing the particle around from place to place. It's not as if there is an equation of motion for the path of the particle making its way to one of those spots where there's a positive value. There are no such equations discoverable in quantum mechanics. And the founders of quantum mechanics made a very uh, large issue out of about saying we know nothing about the path of the particle between measurements. We know nothing about it. We can say nothing about it. Attempts to develop equations with hidden variables like David Bohm or other claims that we must uh, someday uh, be able to predict the particle, including Einstein, who wanted that particle to be here uh, and hope for a, 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 a modern, a, a new uh, future quantum mechanics which would know the path and could tell it particle by particle, that seems impossible. And it's Einstein who told us that the way it is now, uh, we only know statistically where particles will be found. And so he said, quantum mechanics appears to be incomplete. It's not telling us the details of each and every particle and how they came to be distributed in that statistical way. Now, Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr and others complain that Einstein is getting senile, losing it, doesn't really understand that you cannot say anything about the particle. There is, in fact, no objective reality below. Uh, what we know and what we can say using quantum mechanical equations. Below that is uncertainty and one shouldn't try to speak about it and uh, they take a very positivistic attitude that they just want to talk about what they can see and not what they can't see and that led to a great controversy through the years between the founders and Einstein who got very upset with him and I'm reading his uh, private letters about his opinions about these uh, colleagues uh, that they were describing a situation which felt unacceptable to Einstein and as we go forward and I'm finishing this book I hope in the next few months uh, I'll try to say that there's a way to think about this where there is an objective reality and there is a particle and it goes through either slit but we cannot say we know which slit it goes through if we say we know what slit it goes through we lose the interference pattern. And that's another part of the mystery as Feynman describes it. How can our mere knowledge uh, change the results? Well, the answer is we don't know unless we measure where it is. And if we measure where it is, then we know where it is and it's changed the, uh, the picture of what's going on. Well, let's see how we're doing here for time, coming down to just a minute and a half or so for our program and maybe I'll uh, invite you to come back. Let me turn on a little of this music which some people think I should be doing and um, let's see. We will um, next week begin the fifth week uh, of lectures uh, picking a great problem on Monday and um, free will on Tuesday, and then back to a philosopher, probably Robert Kane, on, on Wednesday. And then we'll turn to our metaphysics book for topic uh, Thursday lecture, and back to Albert Einstein for Friday. Um, let me go back one moment to our uh, YouTube page, and this is the one we had here. If I just um, Go to youtube.com in general. Uh, look up the Info Philosopher page. And it takes a little while to find it. I'll just hope you'll be able to find your way around this one. And here is the lecture that we are playing right now. And this is a thing I'd like to study, actually. Uh, how is it that this, uh, well, it's just a frozen frame, that's interesting. There should be some way to see this program uh, in what I call a backhaul mode so that I'm sure that uh, it says here live now. And so maybe if we click on it, we see it. We're running out of time. There I am in time delay. Uh, and I hope I to be able to learn how to do all of this uh, going forward. In the meantime, thank you very much. 
hope to see you again next 